Well, good morning, church family. Well, if we have not met yet, my name is Adam, and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside, and we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Um, if you happen to be a guest with us this morning, we'd love it if you'd fill out one of the Connect cards. Uh, there should be one in the seat back in front of you, and you can do one of two things with that card. Either you can drop it off in the offering plate when it comes by, or on your way out after the service, to your left, there's a Connect wall, and there should be someone there who wants to greet you and take that card from you in exchange for a free gift, just to say thanks for coming to worship with us, and uh, they can also answer your questions you might have about our church family. A few announcements this morning. Uh, First, so our Surfside Community Ministries, that's kind of an umbrella uh, that covers a few different things, and so first, uh, our food bank is coming up in less than two weeks, uh, and we want to have plenty of goods to give away to those who need it, so uh, if you want to donate some non-perishables, you see the list there on the screen. Uh, There's a donation box in the lobby, or you can bring it to the church office anytime this week. Uh, So it's coming up in less than two weeks, so mark your calendar for April the 26th. That's a Friday uh, at 1 o'clock. So if you are free and you want to come uh, minister to people, we want to meet physical needs, but we also want to meet spiritual needs by asking people how they're doing, uh, walk with them in whatever situation they find themselves, and share Christ with them. Second thing is that uh, we have an opportunity to get involved in some of the local shelters here. Uh, A men's shelter, a women's, and a family shelter. So today, right after church today, we're having an interest meeting for anybody who might be interested in volunteering and going to some of those shelters and uh, ministering to some of them as well. So if you are interested and have questions about that, uh, just hang out for a few minutes after church today and we'll hopefully be able to answer your questions. Next Sunday, we have our Discover class. This is a class for uh, new members who have not yet gone through the class, uh, or anybody who is interested in learning more about our church and what it means to be a member here. Uh, You get to meet the staff and uh, tell you a little bit about the history of the church and what we believe and things like that. So we do provide lunch for you, so you can sign up either on the Connect card. There's a box you can check on the back, uh, or you can call the church office anytime. And the last thing is our mission team. Uh, You should have seen them in the lobby as you came in. Uh, They have a table set up out there. They're collecting uh, donations for uh, missions. And it will be a to-go lunch that you can pick up Sunday, May the 5th, um, after church in the fellowship hall. Uh, Again, they're only asking for $10 for a uh, fried chicken lunch for you. This morning I'm going to read from Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 12. But in Acts chapter 3... Uh, The Apostle Peter and John had just healed a crippled man uh, who was a beggar. And then, as a result of doing that, they were able to preach the gospel to those who were around. And for that, they were arrested. And all the religious leaders brought out Peter and John, and they asked them in verse 7, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today for a good deed, done to a sick man. By what means this man was healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man stands before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders that has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you were despised and rejected by the people that you came to save. But we know that that was part of your plan. You had to be betrayed. You had to be accused. You had to suffer so that you could be exalted over everything. And there is no name higher. There is no name with more power. There is no other name in which we can find salvation. So I pray this morning that there would be some that would call upon that name this morning. We ask all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we get into our time of worship.
see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Good morning, church family. Morning. The year was 2007. Kelly and I were just dating at the time, and our home church where we grew up was having vacation Bible school. And so that year, Kelly and I taught the second grade class together. Never forget getting ready for that year as we decorated our room, and we were excited and ready to go. And a lot stands out about that year, but especially there were two kids in our class that I'll never forget that have made a lasting impact in my memory. One was a little boy by the name of Wyatt. Wyatt at the time was just a little runt of a kid, but he would begin to grow after that vacation Bible school, and he would grow, and he would grow, and he would keep growing to the point where he would be about six, seven, three hundred plus pounds, and would go on to be an offensive lineman for the University of South Carolina. Go Gamecocks, amen? Amen. He stands out to me, but there was a little girl who stands out to me even more. Her name was Caitlin. Caitlin wasn't raised in church. Her parents did not know Jesus, but she came to VBS that year. That week, she would get saved and give her life to Jesus, and she would become on fire for the Lord. That week, she would go home and tell her parents, we're going to church. They as a family, her and her sister and parents started coming to church, and as a result, the entire family would end up giving their life to Christ. And so I say that as a way of simply saying, Vacation Bible School to me is a very essential week in the life of our church. And I believe any church that doesn't emphasize it greatly is missing an incredible opportunity to love this community, children, but also entire families for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know it's only two months away, and it seems like we've still got a long time, but we're gearing up June 9th through the 13th, the Great Jungle Journey. We have a quick video, and then I'll share a little more details after that. Guys, if you'd show that video. It's a jungle out there. Every day, our kids encounter questions about their faith. Did God create everything? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I really trust the Bible? At the Great Jungle Journey, kids will explore the answers to these questions and more as they embark on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. As your children sail along on a fun jungle cruise, they'll stop at seven ports of call, the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. Kids will discover how these events shape our world. And they will realize their need for a savior as they reconnect the Bible to their everyday lives. Prepare to swing into fun on the Great Jungle Journey! Did you hear the questions? Every single day, our kids and teenagers are bombarded with questions that cause them to question the reliability and the relevance of their Bibles. And they're bombarded with these questions every single day. It is our responsibility as a church, as an entire church, 
to invest in the next generation so that they might know that the Word of God is both reliable, they can trust it, and it's relevant, meaning that it speaks to every single area of their lives. And I am convinced, Vacation Bible School, yes, it is a ministry focused towards children, but I am convinced it impacts entire families. And therefore, in my opinion, it is an entire church ministry. Today, I am putting out the request to begin praying for Vacation Bible School and also to begin signing up to serve. Uh, last year, if I remember correctly, we had about 115 children that came to our VBS throughout the week. And to support that, we had roughly 90 volunteers to make that a reality. Folks, that is amazing. I've told many different pastors and church leaders that number, and they are utterly blown away by the response of our church to make Vacation Bible School a reality. And so today, let me just ask you, take out your phones. I'm giving you permission to play on your phone during church, okay? Take out your phone. Go to firstfbcsurfside.org slash events. You can do that even during the service, even while I'm preaching. I'm okay with that, okay? Go there. There's two different links. Parents, go ahead and sign your children up so that we know how many to prepare for. But also there is another link for serving. You click that and you can see the ways that you can serve and that will automatically sign you up. And so before this service is over, let me ask you to go ahead and do that so that we might impact the next generation for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray for Vacation Bible School for our offering and for what God is going to do during this service as our ushers come down to take our offering. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for so great of a salvation. Lord, we think about our lives and how in and of ourselves it seems like we are so insignificant. The Bible talks about us being a flower here today and gone tomorrow, just a vapor than the wind. But Lord, yet you know us. You love us. You care for us. And you sent your son Jesus to redeem us out of the broken, sinful world in which we live. And so, Lord, we thank you. And for those of us who have received so great a salvation, now it is our responsibility not just to keep that to ourselves and build just our nice, comfortable country club church. Lord, we are now called to go into this world and make disciples, invest in the next generation. And so, God, I just pray as a church, you would just continue to shake us to our very foundation. Remind us why we are here. And Lord, I pray that through things like Vacation Bible School, Lord, we would make an impact in this area and in the next generation for the gospel. Lord, that there will be children that will hear the sake of the gospel. They'll hear your name and what you've done for them on the cross. And God, it's my prayer that you would just use them to, to grow into mature men and women of God who would impact this world for generations to come. Lord, I thank you for those who give and give so faithfully and generously to make what we do a reality. God, I pray that you would bless the tithes and offerings, but Lord, that you would bless them as a result. Jesus, we thank you and we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand. And covers me there with His hand. I'd like to invite you to stand and sing this with us. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. Shadows 
shepherds be there with his hand. When cold in his brightness transported our rise to meet him in clouds of the sky, his perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I shall with a million.
trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Father, we trust you because you've been so good, Lord, and how you've been faithful in all the events that have happened in our life. And when we seek your face and you answer us, and Lord, we thank you because you are a good God. So as we come to this time in our worship where Pastor Nathan comes and brings the message that you've laid on his heart, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to what you have to say, Lord, and that you would speak through him. And we give this time to you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as our choir makes their way down, we're also going to dismiss our kids for children's church through the fifth grade. So if that applies to you or your family, they can be taken to the lobby and they'll be taken to a time a little bit more age appropriate for them. But today we are going to resume our exposition through the book of Genesis. We took two weeks off for Easter. We're going to get back into it today, Genesis 10, 11 through Genesis, the whole chapter of Genesis chapter 10 into chapter 11, 1 through 9. Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to read all of chapter 10. So today we're just going to be reading chapter 11, 1 through 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn there with us. And today we have Sue Winter that's going to come and read our passage for us. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name of, for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, and the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose will do now, will, no, nothing that they propose will, to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is the reading of God's word. Thank you, Sue. How do you want your name to be remembered? When one day you are dead and gone, what legacy do you want to leave behind? When others remember your name in conversation, what do you want to have said about your name? As we think about history, there are many names that have gone down in the history books as those famous names that have impacted the world. Names like Shakespeare or Washington, Lincoln or Churchill. We think of names like that as those people that have made a great impact on society or on the world as a whole. Those are those famous names. But at the same time, we can think of many different names that have gone down not in fame but in infamy. Those names that have impacted the world in a negative sense, things like in names like Hitler or Stalin, Putin, Dahmer, we think of those types of names as those that have done something unspeakable on this planet. Now for each and every one of us, what we find deep in our hearts, we might not articulate it this way, but that for many of us, our goal is to have our names immortalized in history as those that have done something great in this world. And while certainly we don't want our names to be remembered negatively, I would submit to you there's something that scares us just as much, that our names wouldn't be remembered at all. 
Because the truth of the matter is that for every name that I just mentioned, there are millions, if not billions of names that have lived, died, and are now forgotten. That perhaps one day our names will be remembered no more. So as a result, what do we do? Many times we now spend our entire lives laboring, working, grinding, all of these things so that one day our lives would be remembered. Our fame, our legacy would go down as someone great in our lives. Now certainly there's nothing wrong with success or victory, but the question that I have to ask, is that really what is going to bring me satisfaction? Is that really what life is all about? And is leaving a legacy of my name really what is going to please God with my life? Today we're going to pick back up in Genesis. Remember we are going through this series of Genesis being the foundation of life. Not just the foundation of life itself, but of our very faith. Take away the foundation of Genesis and our entirety of our faith, the entire Christian faith, comes crashing down all around us. And if you go back a few weeks, we left off in Genesis chapter 9. After the flood, God has poured out his righteous wrath on sinful mankind. Noah and his family are brought safely through the ark. And we see Noah as he exits the ark and we think, here we go. Here's a new start, new chance. Things are going to be different this time, right? Wrong. Because even though the ark could bring Noah safely through the flood, there was one thing the ark could not save Noah from, his own sinful heart. His own sinful desires. Because what we saw in chapter 9 is that Noah, after the ark, after seeing all of these amazing things that God has done, goes, gets drunk, passes out, wakes up, and seemingly in a rage, curses his grandson who had nothing to do with the offense that his father had committed. And so that's kind of the backdrop that gives us chapter 10. As now we see all of the nations of the world beginning to be dispersed over the face of the planet. Now, this is actually the second time that's happened. Remember back in Genesis chapter 4, Cain does this? He begins to grow and is dispersed over the face of the planet. And if you remember, it didn't go so good. It didn't go well. Why? Because as man is dispersed over the planet, as he increases on the earth, so is his sin. Sin increases on the world also. So we then turn to chapter 10. Maybe this is going to be different, right? Again, wrong. Sadly, the exact same thing happens here in chapter 10 and 11. As mankind spreads, so does their heart of pride as they seek to build a name, not for the name of God, but a name for themselves. But as we read this, this is what becomes quickly apparent to me. Is that that same heart of pride and rebellion that beat in them, beats in me today. And I have to be careful of living a life only for myself and stealing the glory that is only due the name that is in the name above all names. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare and contrast our name, the name of God, and then ask the question, which name will be remembered? So with that said, let's look first at the name of man. So guys in the booth, I don't have my iPad. It's not working. So... All on you today, okay? So, first point, the name of man. We did not read chapter 10 because of time. But what we see in chapter 10 is the genealogy. And again, we're not going to read it, but I do want to point out some important parts of it because it paints a picture that helps us as we go into chapter 11. Let's be honest. Our Bible reading plans go really well until we hit things like chapter 10. Then we scheme over the genealogies as fast as we possibly can. To our modern minds, it just sounds like a mismatch of names that have absolutely no relevance on our life at all. I want to submit to you that that could not be further from the truth. Actually, what we find here in chapter 10 is the family tree, not just of Noah's three sons, but the entirety of mankind. I want you to stop in just a minute and realize that every single person that is in this room and that has ever lived since Genesis 10 can ultimately trace your heritage back to Genesis 10. 
It doesn't matter what language you speak, what skin color you have, or what your culture is. You can trace your lineage back to Genesis chapter 10. And you're going to see a map on the screen. I don't know if you can see it very well, but essentially what it shows is that all of Noah's three sons disperse over the known world at that time. So Genesis chapter 10, 2 through 5, we see the seven sons of Japheth. Where would Japheth go? He would spread to essentially the north and the east of modern day Israel or the land of Canaan at that time. Genesis 10, 6 through 20, we see the four sons of Ham. Ham's descendants would spread to kind of northeast Africa, Egypt, but also into the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, which, by the way, is still being fought of right this moment. It is the land of Israel. Then in verses 21 through 31, we see the five sons of Shem, which would go on to make up the Shemite people or the Semite people, the Jewish people that would come as a result of Shem. Now, there's a lot of names there, but perhaps one of the most notable names is that Moses, as he is writing, slows down and emphasizes a man in verses 8 through 12 by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod, the passage describes as a mighty and a strong man. Verse 8, mighty man. Verse 9, mighty hunter. So you would think that this is some great and majestic man, strong and mighty. But what is clear is that though he is strong, though he is mighty, he refuses to give the glory to God. In fact, his name literally means rebel. And what we see is that his legacy, his offspring, would be those who would stand in opposition to God. In fact, later in Micah chapter 5 verse 6, we see described the nation of Assyria, whose capital was Nineveh, who Jonah went and preached the gospel to, that wicked and evil city. In Micah 5 6, it is described as the land of Nimrod. So, His lineage, his name would be one of rebellion and opposition towards God. And it seems as though Nimrod is the force or the power behind Babel. Because it sees there in verse 10 that his people would travel east to the land of Shinar. And Shinar would be where the city was built, where the Tower of Babel would be constructed. So, with all of that in mind, now we can turn our attention to chapter 11 and see what the people of Nimrod would do in the land of Shinar. Look with me at verse 1. You'll see it on the screen as well, but let's look at verse 1. It says this, Now the whole earth had one language in the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now, go back to Genesis 9. Genesis 9-1, we saw God reestablish the command to go and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, at first, it seems like mankind is doing a pretty good job with that until we get right here. They get to the land of Shinar, and instead of being fruitful, multiplying, and spreading out, they stop. They build a city. In the middle of that city, as its focal point, was to be this large and great tower. Now, let's be clear. The problem here not, is not necessarily the city or the tower itself. The problem here is not building large cities or skyscrapers or a nice home. That's not what is condemned here. The issue is not the tower. The issue is the hearts behind it. Because notice what it says in verse 4. It says, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, what this does not mean is that this tower literally reached into heaven as though that was the presence of God. This simply is figurative language, meaning this was a really big tower. The idea was that when people would come to this city, they would see in the centerpiece, that focal point of the city would be this majestic, magnificent tower. Now think about it. To this point, mankind would look to God's creation and give God glory. Now mankind wants others to look at his tower and give him the glory. 
You see, this tower was to distract mankind from the Creator to the creation, into man himself. They were to look at this city, look at this tower, and stand in amazement by the ingenuity of this great city, this great tower. You see, they built this city so that they would not have to be dispersed and scattered, but that they could have security in their own name. They built this tower to make a great name for themselves so that would re we would remember them and not God. One author says it this way, The Babel enterprise is all about human independence and self-sufficiency apart from God. The builders believed that they had no need of God. You see their heart clearly in verse 4. Who were they building this tower for? To make a name, not for the name of God, but a name for themselves. It was all for them and their glory. We see the same thing in Daniel chapter 4. We see King Nebuchadnezzar as he is on the rooftops and he is looking out over his kingdom, the land of Babylon, where we get the name from Babylon. He's looking out over that kingdom and he says, quote, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? It was all about him and his great accomplishment. So the question that I have to ask is this again. I asked it at the beginning, I'm going to ask it now, and I'm going to ask it a few more times. What do you want your name to be remembered for? Who are you living your life for? When people remember your name a hundred years from now, if they remember it at all, what will be said? What ideas or thoughts will be remembered by your name? How much of your life is being poured out so that maybe one day your name might be remembered? Is your focus to be like Nimrod, a strong and a mighty man who is self-sufficient on your own? Is your goal to be like the people of Babel, to have others look at your fame and your accomplishments and marvel at how great you are and what you have done in your life? Hear me well, there is nothing wrong with accomplishments, but here is the problem. If your entire life is spent to make a name for yourself, what happens 200 years from now when nobody even remembers your name? What kind of legacy is that? What does it mean when our entire life is poured out to get the trophy or to teach our children that life is about getting that trophy, but then a hundred years from now that trophy is going to be found in the dumpster? What about when our life is all about our fame and our accomplishment? Maybe one day we'll have some great accomplishment and our name will be put on a building to be remembered somewhere. But 500 years from now, that building is either going to be torn down or it's going to fall. No one is going to remember who you are or what you have done. You see, when it comes to building our own legacy, I want to submit to you, that is a very poor legacy to leave behind. Beyond just a few, few names, a thousand years from now, nobody in this room will be remembered. I imagine the name of First Baptist Surfside will not be remembered either. It will be a footnote in the history books. You see, it comes down to this. We see the heart of pride. A lot of times we read the Old Testament and we think, how could they do that? I can't believe they would do something so foolish. But what I want to submit to you is that when you read the Old Testament, what you should see is yourself. Because like them, we want to be immortalized in history so that others would remember our name as something great and as something powerful. But here's the problem. We're pretending to be the king, but the real king is coming. I almost have this picture of my son Jason as he pretends sometime that he was king as he was much younger. And he would put on a robe and he would put on a fake crown and he would pretend to be the king. There's only one problem. The real king is coming. And the Bible says that he will share his throne. He will share his name and his glory with not one person. So we see the name of man. But secondly, what we're now going to see is the name of God. And let's compare and contrast those two realities. I never am ceased to be amazed by the intentionality of the biblical writers. 
We saw this back in Noah as a literary device, back in Noah, of the intentionality of the biblical writers. Essentially, there's a literary device known as a chiasm. The chiasm gives this passage its purpose and its structure. Now, you don't need to remember the name as much as the idea. A chiasm is when the first verse and the last verse of a section of Scripture correlate with one another. And then, as you go inward, those parts correlate with each other, and it builds to a middle verse, and that middle <coughs> verse is what the passage is all about. So, if you could, let's throw that up on the screen. It's the very next slide, I believe. So here's what I'm talking about. The structure of Genesis 11, 1 through 9. So if you notice, the first verse, verse 1, correlates to verse 9. The whole earth had one language, the language of the whole earth. And then as you move inwardly, those verses correlate with one another. So Moses, as he's writing, is writing very intentionally. It's not just a random story. And it builds to what verse? It builds to verse 5. And What does verse 5 say? It says, verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. What's the focus of the story? The focus of the story is not the tower. The focus of the story is not the city. The focus of the story is not the people. The focal point of the story is God. The entire Bible has one central character, and his name is Christ Jesus. He is the focal point. He is what we should focus on in each and every passage. Notice, the Lord, the Lord came down. Now what this does not mean is that God was sitting up in heaven one day and he looks down and says, what are they up to over there? Hey, Gabriel, come here. I need to ask you a question. What's going on over there? And Gabriel says, I have no idea, God. Maybe you need to go down there and figure that out because that doesn't look very good. That's not what happens. God steps down. That doesn't mean that he was not all-knowing or sovereign because the Bible says that he is. It means that it speaks to his transcendence and his supremacy over the events of man. It speaks to him having to step down to see this great thing that man has built. Man builds this great, incredible thing. They think they're so powerful, so wonderful, and yet God has to come down to see it. I almost think about my child as they build a Lego set on the floor and I have to go down to the floor just to see what it is they have created. He goes down. The transcendent, omnipotent, omniscient God has to come down to see what they have done. And I love Psalm 2 verse 4 as it talks about the nations of the earth. It's appropriate for what we're seeing in the world today. The nations of the world as they plot and scheme and all their vanity and what they're doing. And what does it say in Psalm 2 4? It says God looks down on the events and the, the plans of mankind, the sovereign nations. He looks down and it says he who sits in the heavens laughs. He laughs. Mankind thinks this tower is so amazing. God looks at it and he laughs. It is as if it is nothing before him. Look what he says in verse 6. It says in verse 6, the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. God looks at mankind, what they are constructing, and he realizes that they together will have no end to their pride and their sin. That even though they have created something great, that great accomplishment will be one purpose only for themselves. You see, I think about our society now. And all the modern advancements, the technological leaps, and how amazing they are. And yet each one of those, every time there is a new cure, a new uh, technological advancement, there is a false promise that is given with it. We are fed the lie that if we can just get that cure, that advancement, then society is just going to be better. We're now all going to come together and life is going to improve as a result of those technological advances. And I don't want to take away from those advances, but what we find is that our accomplishments of mankind, as the knowledge of man increases... What increases with it? Our sin. And essentially what we have done is simply found more elaborate ways 
to sin, to rebel against God, to steal the glory that only belongs to His name. God looks at these events of mankind and He laughs. And again, I want to submit to you that though we see Babel and their rebellion against God, that same heart beats within each and every one of us. And Scripture is abundantly clear. God will give His glory to no one. We want to steal the glory of God, and yet God is a jealous God. We'll go through a few passages of Scripture. Mason, let me see if you can keep up there. All right, buddy? All right. Exodus 34, 14. You shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. We think of jealousy as a negative thing. As like an obsessive thing, that jealous girlfriend or boyfriend, we think of that as a negative thing. And yet when it comes to God, He alone is able to be jealous. Why? Because He alone is worthy of the glory due His name. In fact, I believe there is a beautiful theme in the Bible that we don't focus on much. The name of God. Notice the power of the name of God. Notice in Jeremiah 14, 7, it says this. Though our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Who was God to work for and to act? Was it for us? Well, yes, we're benefited by it, but ultimately it is for His name when you realize that His name is really just a synonym for His glory. God, act, do this so that your glory might be spread through the nations. Notice what it says in Psalm 79, 9. He says, help us, O God, for our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sin. For who? Your name's sake. Do this work among us so that others might not see us. They might see you, O God, and see your great name glorified among the nations. You see, God is jealous for His name because He alone is worthy of that name. In fact, let me give you three reasons why it is right for God to be jealous for His name. Number one, it is because He alone deserves the praise and the adoration. You see, this morning, I could on this stage parade every single powerful person that has ever lived. Every king, every ruler, every emperor, every president that has ever lived and ever will live. And I could parade them across this stage one at a time. And you could see them in all their majesty, their power, their glory. And you could add it all together. And all of their power and majesty combined would still not touch the hem of his garment. He alone is due the glory His name. Secondly, it is through His name that we have salvation. Acts 4.12 There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We have rebelled against the name of God. We want others to see our name. Salvation only comes when we surrender that and we glorify His name through our faith. Third, it is through His name that we have healing power, protection. 1 Samuel 12, 22. The Lord will not forsake His people for them. No, for His name's sake. Psalm 23, 3. We read this at funerals of this good shepherd. And it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Again, for who? For His name's sake. God is a jealous God, and He alone is worthy of the glory, the worship, the beauty of His name. You see, what Genesis has shown us so clearly, we've seen it through 11 chapters now, that today if we put our hope and trust in the name of man or woman, we are going to be disappointed. We're going to go into confusion. We are going to be hopeless. You see, that's an important question because the other question I have for you this morning is, who are you trusting in? Which name are you putting your hope into? That's an important question, folks, because I don't know if you realize this, we have an election coming up. I don't know if you realize that, but 2024 is an election year. I don't know if you realize that. But over the course of this year, 2024, for the next seven months, you at nauseam are going to hear two names. And those names are going to be presented time and time again as if they are the Savior of this country 
in the world. Now hear me well. Elections matter. How we vote is important. However, Babel reminds us that if you put your ultimate hope in one of those two men, you are going to be greatly disappointed. There is only one name that is sovereign, one name that can save, and that name is not Biden, that name is not Trump, that name is Christ Jesus. And we need to be firm on that, folks. We have to be careful of trying to paint a person as though he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. Folks, I'll say this bluntly. I know I'm meddling. I'm probably going to trouble for this, but I'm going to say it anyways. We've got to be careful of what we post on social media this year. We have to be very careful of painting people like Donald Trump in the same light as Jesus himself. Because let us be clear, there is only one name by which we would say, one name that will stand into eternity. His name is Christ Jesus. And one day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That includes Biden and Trump. Both of them one day will bow the knee and declare that Jesus, not themselves, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who are you putting your hope into? So we see the name of man. We see the name of God. The last question, the third idea I see is this. Whose name will be remembered? Let's see what God's reaction is. Notice in verse 7. He says, come. Let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So in response to their united rebellion against him... He comes, confuses their language, and spreads them over the face of the planet. God commanded, be fruitful and multiply, spread off and fill the earth. They said no. And God says, well, guess what? I'm going to do it anyways. Hear me well. God will always accomplish his purposes. The only question is, is are we going to be obedient to those purposes? God will accomplish his purpose with or without you, often in spite of you. God will always accomplish his purposes. Now, as we see this in the dispersion of languages over the face of the planet, here's what I want us to be careful of. This in no way implies that there is any one language or group of people or skin color that is the result of sin from this account. That's not what it's teaching at all. What we do need to take from this this morning is that any idea, any religion, any movement, any hope in men or women, one day will always fall. One day, if you put your hope into a person, into a party, into a government, one day you are going to be woefully disappointed. You see, God comes and he scatters them over the face of the earth. But what I want you to see is that's not the end of the story. In fact, that just sets up really the next stage of human history. As we see now, starting in chapter 11, verse 10, we're going to see this next week more. But the very next verse, there's hope. God disperses man over the face of the planet. The very next verse, there's hope. Because immediately after, we see Moses writing, pick back up on the descendants of Shem. Again, remember the Shemite or the Semite people. And what we're going to see is that through Shem, a man by the name of Abraham is going to come. And in Genesis 12, 2, God is going to come to Abraham and he is going to say to Abraham that he is going to make his name great. Babel came to make their name great and God said, I have nothing to do with that. He's going to go to Abraham, someone who seemingly comes from nowhere, and he's going to say, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. And what we're going to see is that through Abraham, his descendants, he would develop a nation, a people, a lighthouse, the people of Israel that were to be the light to the dark nations all around, that have been scattered all around. They were to be the ones that those nations could look back to and say, man, how good is it to be the people of God? And yet what do we see again? We see there's no salvation in man. 
We see there's ultimately no salvation in Israel. We see that even though Israel would walk with God for a time, they would still rebel against Him. It is a reminder again that man cannot save. And you see, that's what we are reminded of when we think about our salvation. You see, our salvation is not based our, on our works, on what we can do. It's not on the works of man. You see, what religion is, is when we build our tower of good works as though we are trying to get up to God. We are trying to build our way to heaven. But what we celebrate at Christmas time is that God, again, He came down here in the Tower of Babel. He came down again, but this time He walked among us. He clothed Himself in human flesh. He came to die on the cross, the death that we deserve, so that we might live even though we do not deserve it. We might be made new and given everlasting life, not based on our works, but based on His work on the cross. The Bible says that it is that Jesus that would become the cornerstone. And that through Christ, there would be built a new people, a new nation, a new kingdom. 1 1 Peter 2, 9 says is a new race, a new kingdom that would be called the church. The church. That God creates the church, not just this church, but the church of all people who have claimed the name of Christ to be His people on this earth. That would be brought from all the nations of the world to one new kingdom. For what purpose? What would be the purpose of the church? Again, would it just be to build some new and greater building? To some new and greater program so that people might know the name of First Baptist Surfside? Not at all. No, the Bible is clear. He brings us together as His people. Why? So that He can send us out and scatter us among the nations. Matthew 28, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Why? Romans 1, 4. For the sake of His name among all the nations. So we are called to go and make disciples of all the nations so that God would create a new kingdom that would now be centered not on a tower but on a throne. He would be the center of that nation. And that is the task we have been given, church, is not to build our comfortable social country club, but to go in the nations and make disciples of all nations. And that's going to culminate in one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Revelation chapter 7, 9 and 10. We see the culmination of that when John looks. And in Revelation 7, 9, he sees a great multitude from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I've asked it twice now. I'm going to ask it again. What legacy are you leaving behind? How will your name be remembered? Today I want to submit to you that if you are building your life all about your fame, your glory, your legacy, that that glory might shine for a moment, but it is a fading glory. In the end, like Babel, you are going to find yourself divided, confused, and destroyed. What if I told you today that you were created for something so much greater? That you have a purpose far greater than just building your empire of sand on this earth. That the very reason you were created, the very reason you have breath in your lungs, is to bring glory and honor to His name and not your own. That your purpose is to be like John the Baptist in John 3.30 when he says, I must decrease so that He might increase. That the very purpose of your life is to get out of the way so that others, when they see you and they hear your name, they don't think of you, they think of Jesus. They think of Him living in and out of your life. How many people have given their lives so that the name of Jesus might be exalted? I think about people like a man by the name of Sergi. Sergi came to our sunrise service two weeks ago. The service was wrapping up and from the crowd a man came and he introduced himself and Sergi began to share his story. He is a missionary for CRU or what used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. 
And I began to have a conversation with Sergi, and I asked him where he served, and he looked at me and he says, I serve in the Ukraine. I said, Sergi, I'm so sorry for what is happening to your country and the devastation that is caused there. I said, it has to be so hard to share the gospel in that kind of context. And he says, yes, it is challenging. It certainly has been a difficult season. But he said, you know, because of what is happening, people are in my country are more open to the gospel perhaps than ever before. And we are seeing people give their life to Christ. Sergi's name's not going to go on a building one day. We're not going to hear it in the papers. We're not going to hear it online. We're not going to see it on social media. But his life has been poured out for the sake of the name of Jesus. We want the big fame, the big recognition, but I want to submit to you that probably the greatest people that have ever lived, you're never going to hear their names. Many of the wisest people that have ever lived will never write a book. Their names are not going to go in a building. They're going to be nobodies who gave their lives so that the name of Jesus might be exalted among the nations. Now, here's my concern. My concern is that as we read a passage like this about exalting the name of Christ, sometimes there might be a reaction that is to me just as dangerous. Because sometimes in the Christian life we hear this and think, okay, well now our reaction should be just to do nothing and not, not achieve great things and just kind of sit back in our lives. Notice, this passage doesn't tell us not to build towers. It tells us to build towers for the glory of God. You see, there's a teaching that I don't believe is biblical that, that we just need to sit back and not achieve anything great in our lives. Today, I would argue the opposite. If there's a young person in this room and you're wanting to know what to do with your life, I would tell you, go and do the best you possibly can. Go and win that trophy. Go and get the scholarship, get the degree, earn the money, build the fame. Do all that you can to, to do those things in life. But here's the difference. When you've built your tower and people come to marvel at your tower, tell them that tower doesn't belong to you. That tower's for the glory of God. And when you lift up that trophy, lift high the name of Jesus. When you get that title, speak not of yourself but of the name of Christ. When you get those riches, do not spend them on yourself but use them to invest in the kingdom of God. I'll ask it again, what legacy are you leaving behind? Let me ask you this, would you really be okay if nobody remembered your name, but as a result of your life, the name of Jesus was exalted? Would you be okay with that? You see, I have to ask myself the question, what am I going to be remembered for? I'll never forget, I was starting ministry, it was probably 10 plus years ago now, and I remember someone asked me the question, Nathan, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? I thought about it for a moment, and I answered similarly, but I would answer it this way. Fifty years from now, I likely will not be the pastor of this church. Fifty years from now, I'm going to have my name written somewhere, probably in a book, that I was the pastor. Somebody's going to be thumbing through that book, and they're going to come across Nathan Sweet. And I'll say, who is that guy? They're going to call up somebody that maybe knew me some and say, hey, who was that Nathan Sweet guy? person I have, I have this image in my mind is going to laugh and they're going to say, oh, that was that pastor. He was that young pastor who came in and just messed everything up. He was that pastor. He was young and he was dumb and he didn't listen to nobody. That was that pastor. That's what one person is going to say. This is what I pray is said. If nothing else, this is what I won't said. I pray someone would say, oh yeah, he did a lot of dumb things. He made a lot of mistakes. But one thing was true. He loved Jesus. And his very heart was that we would love Jesus too. Let me ask you, will the same be true of you? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. And Lord, we thank you that your name is greater. Lord, forgive us for making it about ourselves. Our name, our business, our church, our school. Lord, forgive us for stealing your glory. Lord, I pray today that we would recognize that the only name that is eternal, the only name worthy of worship, is the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that a hundred years from now, when none of us are barely remembered, that the name of Jesus would be exalted as a result of our lives. 
Jesus, we thank you. We love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I don't know how you need to respond today, but God does. Today we're going to stand and we're going to sing about the name of God. And as you do, let me challenge you to respond as only God would wish. Would you stand or would you sing? A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever and if you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to the land song forever and amen and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever
Amen. Just want to say thanks again for worshiping with us. Remember, if you are interested in being a part of the shelter ministry, we're going to have that meeting in five minutes. So just hang out in here and we'll get started. But as always, we have now gathered as the church. Let's go and be the church. Have a blessed day.